might think the physics will never work. Well, the physics is working already. So what is fusion? Well, here we have the process of nuclear fission, which is uh, the basis of all current nuclear power plants. What happens is big atoms become medium-sized atoms, and we gain that much energy. Fusion is over here. Little atoms become big atoms, get much more energy. One of the great benefits of fusion energy is that the fuel is abundant and easily available. It's comprising two types of hydrogen, heavy hydrogen. One is known as deuterium. It's available in seawater, for instance, and easily separated. The other is tritium, radioactive type of hydrogen. Tritium is slightly harder to obtain, but the good news about fusion is it can be made within the fusion device itself. What you do is you mix lithium into the blanket, and this, when hit with neutrons, generates the tritium that you need. They come together at high speed, overcoming electrical repulsion, and they fuse, releasing large amounts of energy. The energy is carried away in very fast particles that are produced. One is a charged alpha particle, because it's electrically charged, it's held within the machine. The other is a neutral particle, the neutron. It flies out of the machine, and that is the key for usable energy from fusion. The neutrons are created by the fusion reaction, and they travel at very high speed in all directions at once. Ideally, in a fusion power plant, they're slowed down in something called the blanket. It receives the energy from the neutrons and converts it into heat, from which you might make electricity. On the left, what we have in blue is the fusion progress on a standard index. And it's gone faster than chips in your PC, and mischievously, they point out, better than high energy physics. The real issue is not the physics, it's the engineering reliability. Well, basically, what you have is a transformer. The green shows the hot plasma gas. And it is the secondary of a, of a transformer. The primary is the yellow, winding on the left. It's all held in place by very large, very high power superconducting magnets. That is, they have zero resistance. And conventionally, those magnets are made of something called niobium tin. It's a very special alloy. And it's cooled by liquid helium. And it's challenging and it's expensive. It's comprised of over a thousand superconducting strands, niobium three tin multi-filamentary composite wire and a copper matrix and contained in a high strength alloy that's there for structural reasons. Also you can see that there's a central cooling tube through the center that's to lower the pressure drop when we pump supercritical helium through the conductor through long lengths maybe up to one kilometer for ITER and that will be used to remove the heat that's deposited from AC losses in the pulse magnets for example like the central solenoid uh, but also in the toroidal field coil, which is a DC magnet, it's used primarily to remove the nuclear heating. In this facility we are measuring um, properties of superconducting cables, shown here, superconducting cable and a superconductor inside, and we try to measure the properties in magnetic field and under mechanical strain. Usually when we measure superconductors, we test one little single wire, uh, less than a millimeter in diameter, and that's difficult enough. But when we have a multi-strand cable of over a thousand superconducting wires, then it's difficult to do a very good measurement in high magnetic field to test it to its limits to see what its performance will be. In this case, we have here some samples of over 1,000 strand superconducting cable designed for the ITER TF coils, which will be tested in a special facility in Switzerland. They're contained in this cable and conduit conductor inside this steel conduit. Uh, the ends, although don't display much now, have been specially prepared where we've stripped the steel jacket away and cleaned the chromium plating off them to make a good contact. There's further processing to be done. We'll use these termination sections, which are made of uh, copper pre-welded to steel, and then uh, these will be swaged over the end to make a good electrical contact. You are seeing behind me is the test arrangement for the ITER toroidal field model coil and uh, you see here on this side this is the ITER TF model coil it's a subsized coil in the linear dimension three times smaller than the original ITER coils that means the ITER coils are three times larger in both linear dimensions and the testing uh, of this coil took place in the neighbor of an old coil which we have, which you might see a little bit on these rings on the backside, that this background coil is providing the non-planar forces to this ETA model coil simulating the forces in the toroidal arrangement. They have forces between each other. Overall weight of this arrangement 
those coils together with the frame is about 112 metric tons. And this whole system has to be cooled down to liquid helium temperature. And uh, you need about two weeks to cool it down with our big refrigeration system. This is then moved by the crane into this cryogenic vessel. Of course, the upper part is first removed. The fusion power plant of the future is going to be a big machine. It's going to be comparable to some of the biggest electricity generating plants that we have in operation today. Coal plants or nuclear fission plants. It'll be at least a thousand megawatts electric. And it's going to have to be reliable. Typically it's going to have to run for at least 6,000 hours a year. Design of International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor was around for many years and the final design looks very impressive and very modern. Participation of many countries in the project reflects the global interest and very high cost. As the name Experimental Reactor indicates, ITER will not produce any electricity to the grid. The actual reactor which will do it is called DEMO and it should generate electricity by 2035. DEMO does not differ conceptually from ITER, but it should produce continuously energy. By this time, the hydrogen economy will be well established and then there will be a high demand for hydrogen. There is only one problem, there will be predicted shortage of helium by 2035, so cooling of the superconducting magnets will be done by liquid hydrogen or liquid nitrogen. Therefore, an intensive research and study is required to define which of the alternative superconductors, such as magnesium diboride, bismuth 2212 or IPCO, are going to be the most suitable for demomagnetic coil windings. If you want to make fusion for the electricity industry, you need to synchronize with national grids on 50 hertz with no tolerance for error. If you're making hydrogen using fusion, you're creating an energy product that you store, and therefore you don't need this reliability. Bartek mentioned magnesium diboride. This is the breakthrough for Fusion Island, and the concept was born. Richard Clark and his colleagues from Cullum um, realized that by the use of large fuel cells, flywheels, and supercapacitors, we could break that final link to the electricity grid. On Fusion Island, hydrogen is everywhere. It is the product that you sell commercially and store here in liquid form that you ship to global markets. It is the key way to reduce the magma costs. You cool with your product, but with special liquid helium. We don't use niobium tin. We use something called magnesium diboride. You never take any power from the power grid. You use large fuel cells to kickstart your machine. Because in the 2050s, when we have fusion electricity, it will be several percent of the British supply. If it were to trip out, restarting the machine would use electricity that the system operator, the national grid, might not have. So when you think of plasma physics, you think of big tokamak experiments. Sometimes you can have a smaller one. This is an experiment that's very similar to a tokamak, but it's designed to study uh, some basic plasma physics. Plasmas not only exist in the laboratory, but actually most plasmas are found in nature, and the biggest plasmas you can find are when you look up at the stars and look up in the heavens. There's two examples, plasmas surrounding Jupiter. There's another example uh, much closer. Earth itself is a giant magnet, and it confines a plasma around it, its own, its own magnetosphere. But instead, what we've done is replace the, the, the planet with a loop of wire. And what we do is we levitate that loop of wire so that the field lines go in through the loop of wire and back out and they don't touch anything and they're not lost. So, so any particle that goes into the, the aurora borealis actually goes back out through the southern pole and, and, and continues to circulate in the plasma. So here's how we do it. What we have is a coil that's just superconductor down on the bottom. We charge it up and we cool it down so, that it's a, so, it, so it can freeze in its magnetic field and the current keeps running around in the loop. We then pick it up into the middle of the chamber and we turn on a coil above which tracks it and we put a couple of uh, lasers across here to make sure we know its position and we levitate it with feedback. Imagine this is our superconducting magnet, it's just a normal magnet. What we would do is we'd charge it up and then become a magnet and we would lift it into position and the magnet above tracks it. There's actually the current, as it moves, the current goes up and down to make sure that it's stabilized in, in the center. So this is a nice picture and looks good on paper, but this is the actual five meter diameter chamber. I'm suiting up because the plasma likes to be very clean uh, and I don't want to add any 
uh, dirt into the environment where the plasma is made, because that will tend to cool it off. Give you a scale. This is a dipole coil that's a superconductor. It weighs basically half a ton. We're going to charge it up, put one mega ampere of current in it, lift it into this position, and there'll be a series of lasers that cross back and forth across the, the chamber here, telling us exactly the position of the coil so that we can adjust current in a, in a regular magnet above and attract it upwards so that it doesn't fall.